I'm letting you into a secret. I have a very exciting free mini course coming for you. Reset your health in 30 days, which will enable you to unlock the power to reduce stress, improve your physical, mental, and emotional well-being, and take charge of your health. Sign up now via my website, www.sarahannmacklin.com. Welcome to the first episode of 2023, where we'll be tackling the elephant in the room, financial health and its impact on our well-being. Now, in today's world, money plays a significant role in our lives, but it's not the only factor in our happiness and our success. In fact, research has shown that our financial health is closely linked to our mental, emotional and physical health. thing is, is that we only all of us only have 24 hours in a day and so I always encourage people to do a time audit where they look at the 24 hours of the day over a seven day period and actually look and see how they're spending it and does how they're how they spend it does it align to what they want to do with their lives and um, like their whole lives not just their careers in my opinion wealth isn't measured in your wallet it's measured in your calendar so I'm thrilled to be joined in this episode with Melanie Yusevi. She is the chair and co-founder of the Black British Business Awards and director of strategy and consulting at Accenture. She is also the author of Financial Wellness and How to Find It. And she has experienced firsthand the effects of financial stress and overall well-being. Together in this episode, we'll be exploring the concept of financial freedom and sharing tips and strategies for achieving greater financial health and overall well-being. Tune in and learn how to measure wealth in your calendar and how to achieve the ultimate life's currency, freedom. Melanie, welcome to this week's episode of Live Well Be Well, the first one of 2023. Yay! <laughs> um, how are you? I'm well, I'm well, a bit frazzled, you know, anyone with a newborn is frazzled, no sleep, but um, yeah, it's, it's just been a blessing. So I'm really good. It's a, it's a good start to the year. Well, I'm very happy to welcome you and your newborn, Max, onto this episode. Yeah. I feel like he's going to have a wealth of knowledge, financial knowledge by the end of this. He is, he is. He's going to be a millionaire. <laughs> Max the millionaire, I love it. And I was speaking to you about this actually this week, wasn't I? That I think we're 100 episodes in and I cannot believe I've not covered an area on financial health because it's such a big part of how we feel overall so I cannot wait to get into this with you because I know that you've obviously done a lot in your life but one of the main things as well is that you've written the book Financial Wellness and How to Find It and we're going to delve into that very shortly but before we do the one thing I want to ask you before we delve into that is Melanie what have you changed your mind about in the last 10 years? What have I changed my mind about in the last 10 years? I have changed my mind about what happiness means to me. I think I had a very linear view of what happiness looked like in regards to the job that I would have, what I was doing with my time, when I would be doing it, where I would be doing it. Uh, I thought, you know, I would have a nice job in the suburbs of London with my partner, having children, working full time for one company in one city. And so that's definitely changed. I, I'm so glad I let myself change as well. So now I you know, work in Barbados and I work here. I have um, a partner who is a surfer and a painter who is in totally different fields from me and my, my, business, my, my businesses and never thought I would have a book as well. So I think in general, it was just about being flexible enough to be able to take up the opportunities that were offered to me even if they didn't look like what I planned for. I think that's such a great answer. And also so inspirational for anyone listening to this, maybe feeling beginning of the year, trying to set out their goals and what they want to achieve and maybe how they want their 2023 to look. Just hearing that, especially for me, hearing your journey is really inspiring. So before we get into financial well-being, which maybe is something, a term that people might not have heard of before. Can we talk a little bit about how you got into this and how did you change your life? How did this elope over the last few years? I was working full-time for a really lovely large company, but I'd always wanted to be an entrepreneur. 
And I realized that even though I had business ideas, I actually didn't have the freedom to go and start my own business. I was living almost paycheck to paycheck and I was making more money than most. And I was still eating lovely lunches and dinners and buying lovely handbags. And I lived in a nice flat. And But when I really wanted to do something with my time that I, I wanted to really do in terms of being an entrepreneur, starting a business, I realized I wasn't free. I didn't have the time or the resources to kind of spend dedicating to starting up a business. So that was like the first signal that something was kind of wrong with my finances. The second thing that was wrong with my finances, well, a second kind of hint was when I, um, my friend and I, we used to watch, um, or we still do watch kind of uh, the Real Housewives franchise. And we do it on a kind of a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis. We watch it together. And I was going over there and one day she said, Mel, is it okay if I do my budget at the same time? And I'm like, sure, no problem. And so there she was with her, you know, laptop and her spreadsheets and her, you know, receipts and stuff and bills and whatever. And every two weeks she'd be doing this. And so I was like, wait a minute, I'm like, I'm missing a trick here. You know, let me just do it with you. I'm like, okay. But, but then I obviously I had to set up a budget. And the thing is, I didn't realize that actually making money takes time. You know, it takes investment of time. And it was also fun as well because we were eating snacks. We were drinking wine. We were watching Real Housewives of Atlanta. And we were doing our finances as well. So the time would just pass quickly. And then we added more and more people to the group and more and more people. And all of a sudden, there was 10 black women around the table who, you know, all now are good friends because we were doing our budgeting together. But then we also started talking about our goals. We started talking about our bills. We started talking about investment. We started talking about retirement. We started talking about our children. And so you just realized that money was just the source of me feeling really, really stable to be able to go off and do some of the things that I've done. Wow. And so how did this then translate into what we're doing now? Because I know that you ended up kind of making that into having speakers come in. So talk to me a little bit about how you've managed to make that leap from creating that budget with your friends at home or especially that specific friend who sounds amazing by the way the fact that she encouraged that she, she well she didn't really encourage it i kind of just dra dragged just down her coattails to be honest but what um we started to you know all of a sudden we started to think about just some of the things that we wanted to do with our time like our goals and so um we were at the time when we were trying to buy our first homes and so then we got a mortgage advisor to visit us. Um, and then he was talking to us about kind of first home, homes, getting on the ladder, that kind of thing. And then we had investment managers um, visit us as well. Uh, we had an accountant visit us as well, just in terms of some of the accounting terms and being able to really optimize our money. So we were having these like guest speakers. So all of a sudden it turned into a group. And then I guess that's when I birthed out Money Moves, the program and the book that I wrote because that's when I started having them just for like random strangers, because it just felt like women particularly weren't empowered about their money. I did, you know, we were making more and more money than ever before, but in terms of just saying, okay, well, this is my money and this is what I contribute to society. And this is how, what I get back. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. So then yeah, a birth a program. And all of a sudden there was like 30 to 40 strangers in one of my classes in the university and I brought out, you know, kind of 90s R&B and hip hop and snacks and wine and all this, and we were just all talking about our finances and we dropped into intimacy direct, like automatically, like all of a sudden we were talking about, you know, goals to have children, you know, freezing our eggs, talking about changing jobs, talking about going back to school like we started talking about big things and then we started talking about small things like changing our service providers our our mobile phone provider and you know to cheaper deals and things of the like and it just became an ongoing community that we moved online and it was just it was amazing to me because women can talk about their vaginas really kind of you know easily with each other um, we can also talk about our periods we can talk about our stool and our bowel movements but when it came to talking about money god help us it just wasn't where you know it was there was a, there was this level of shame in stuff that it was just crazy it was absolutely crazy so mal can you actually explain to me what does financial well-being look like what does that even mean because i mean you've written a whole book on this and it's going to be very hard to probably sum it up in a sentence but in essence what does it look like when we're looking at financial health i think in essence, to make it really easy, 
let's think about public health. That's related to public health. We know ourselves what we have to do to inspire kind of physical health and physical wellness, right? Like we have to eat well, we have to sleep, we have to work out as well, have physical activity. And when there is a new way of doing things or a new phase in our lives, let's just say it's having a baby or it's menopause or it's breaking a leg, then we have experts and advisors. We go to doctors, we go to nurses. We're entitled to that, right? Like we actually say, that's the way forward. There's information there that we don't know, detailed information. We don't know how to operate on our own heads, our own legs, but there are experts who do. That's where we want to go to for financial wellness. So, you know, we know the good things that we have to do to take care of our own finances. It means that we are earning money and we are also paying money as well. Like that's just kind of the bare bones basics of transactions. But when we're going into new phases of our lives, um, just say buying a new home or moving house or perhaps having children, then it should be made available to us to kind of know these things, to, to know and be able to seek out expert um, expertise and advisors or read books. We, f we should feel entitled to do that um, and be able to move along healthily as well. So whether that be progressing in terms of pay rises or charging our clients differently, but we don't have that. Financial wellness doesn't have that same sort of entitlement. Um, financial health doesn't have that same sort of entitlement. It basically, it's like we're almost fooled that we should know these things. And if we don't know these things, then we're not very responsible adults. We saw this with the pandemic. Everyone said, oh, you know, you should have three months or six months emergency savings. Let's keep it real. That pandemic hit us all and most of us didn't have three to six months emergency savings. And then on top of that, coming out on the other side of it, now with the cost of living crisis that's hitting everyone in the planet, essentially, then again, you know, people are caught without, with, you know, with their pants down and saying, okay, we don't have savings. And so instead of saying, okay, well, actually, you know, people should have savings. Well, maybe we should look at why people don't have these savings, why people are not prepared, why this financial crisis is, you know, has such a long tail for most of us. So that's why I say for financial health and financial wellness, it's not about knowing everything and doing everything right. It is about being on a journey that where your money and your life are linked and that if you don't know the answers to the next point in your journey or the next phases of your journey, then you feel entitled to get that information, that you have all the resources available to you so that you can find the answers for yourself. Just hearing that, how can we evaluate time against money? Because I feel like some people feel like they have a lot of assets and feel very, very extremely time poor. And it relates a lot to your journey, actually, where that was kind of a tipping point for you. How can we kind of address that more in ourselves? Because I think we are coming to a part within our society where we are loading ourselves with more work, more commitment, more time, more plans. Um, but that is a big stress and strain in our health full stop. So how can we reassess that? The thing is, is that we only, all of us only have 24 hours in a day. And so I always encourage people to do a time audit where they look at the 24 hours of a day over a seven day period and actually look and see how they're spending it. And does how they're, how they spend it, does it align to what they want to do with their lives? Um, like their whole lives, not just their careers. So we do timesheets for work and I want us to do a timesheet for our life. For example, um, I want it to be a better daughter. I want to be a better mother. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good kind of colleague at work. I want to be a good neighbor. Um, that takes investment. It takes investment. It means that I call my mother every Wednesday and Sunday. It means that I spend quality time with my son and, and have him exposed to you know, what I do so that we can have a closer relationship. It means that I speak to my neighbors and I know my postman in my community. and that all takes time. We, particularly again for um, women, but actually it's afflicting everyone now, we're not tracking like what we do to take care of others and to build relationship with others. We're tracking the work, but we're not tracking the, the stuff that actually makes our spirits fly and makes the relationships grow and makes our hearts grow and, and link together in community. And so that's why I always encourage the time audit because particularly I find with women, 
because we're in so many caring roles in our lives, whether we're caring for our parents or caring for our children or caring for others, then we don't track all of that. And that's actually a big part of who we are and what we want to do with our lives. So financial health and wellness has to incorporate everything that you spend your time on, not just working for someone else or working on your business. It has to encompass how you spend your time as well because, hey, if you think about it, that's why you know so many people are working like four days a week because they realize, wait a minute, is it worth working a whole day if I could spend that time with my children or if I could spend that time doing some gardening or doing something that I love, they're starting to have that, you know, realize the time kind of money equation. I'm just thinking of the Tim Ferriss there, the four hour work week is as yeah. you're talking about that. And it's a big thing, right? We're not really taught much around how to segment our time efficiently. And I think that's a really big thing. Where would you say people should start there? Because I think maybe some people feel really inspired listening to this and I feel very inspired listening to you regarding this where would and I'm sure you're also your son's going to grow up to be very time efficient but where where can people start here because some people might just say well I don't have time to do a time audit and I think there's a lot of times that people can feel overwhelmed that how could I then put that into four days where should people start with this people can start their own time audit by just carrying around a little piece of paper or a little booklet a notepad and just note the things that you're doing I don't want you to forget what time it takes to, you know, commute to work. I don't want you to forget when you stopped off at the grocery store after work. I don't want you to forget the time that we spend scrolling on our phones and social media. All this time, um, if you just start with a little notepad, uh, I have a little chart in my book that you can copy down and, you know, and, and create, recreate for yourself. And... It's eye-opening if you do it after, just for seven days, just for seven days, just to see it. Because the thing is, what gets measured gets done. And if you're not measuring your time, then it's really, really hard to kind of change how you use your time in order to seek your own goals and to seek out, you know, and to do the things that you actually want to do. And particularly, I would say, you know, if you're caring for others, if you are caring for your elders, caring for children if you're caring for colleagues then those little they they kind of seep away at your time and what i'm i'm not saying that you should stop doing them at all what i'm saying is that i want you to be in in an empowered place where you've made a decision to do it i've made a decision to you know call my mom and spend time with her i've made a decision to spend some special time with my son i've made a decision to make tea for my colleagues or bake a cake rather than it being just you know little little pebbles that are kind of seeping out of your life pebbles of time that are seeping out of your life and at the end of it you don't even know you know where all the time went so start off really really small um even with your finances i would say in terms of budgeting start off really small just start off like with one portion of your life start off by just doing it for one hour but don't kind of kill yourself by just throwing a big old hammer (laughs) <laughs> when you're trying to kill a fly, let's just start small um, and just realize that actually it's a journey. This is all a journey. You're not going to be perfect and complete after doing it for two hours. Well, I think that's the thing, right? It's always, I love this phrase where it's look at the step ahead of you, not the full staircase. And if someone's listening to this who has never really looked at their finances or their financial well being, you know, all of this information at once can feel quite overwhelming. But actually, it's just taking that one step, that one accountable step, where you actually can just take a step back and look. So I'm really empowered that we're talking about this for the first episode of 2023, because so much is around mindset, I think, with financial health. And for any of us listening to this, How can we map out a mindset around money starting this year? Because a lot of people, I imagine, will be sitting down, writing goals, maybe around their nutrition, maybe around their physical health, maybe around things they want to achieve this year. But money and the mindset might not be popped into that. So let's try and change that. How can people map out their mindset around money to start off 2023? What's some actionable steps? I would say, unfortunately, you do have to start with figuring out where you are. And that means that you'd want to kind of look at your a budget or a cash flow 
So looking at how you spent your money and how you want to spend your money. I have a really easy breezy spreadsheet that's available on my website, uh, my book, in my book. So that you can use those to just really start off and you have to take stock of where you are. It's kind of like saying, okay, well, Mel, where do you want to go? But you're not, you don't have a map. You don't know where you are. It's kind of, it's tough to give you directions. So you need to kind of take stock. But good news is, is that you can make it fun. Don't lock yourself away in a dark room. And, you know, just look at your, <laughs> look at all your statements around you. You know, like. I think that uh, would take me into a downward spiral. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, look at it. The way that we do it with the, our budget parties is that we have our monthly meetings and they're, we're playing music in the background and there is wine and tea and snacks and there is, or we're doing it and we're, you know, playing some reality TV. Right now I'm obsessed with Below Deck because I'm cold. So that's why I want to be somewhere warm. That's why I'm always looking at, I look at Below Deck and I'm doing my finances. And honestly, it is literally about saying, how much do I need to live on this planet? If I look at my gardening, if I look at toiletries, if I look at my rent, if I look at my um, services, then how much do I need to live on this planet every month in the current way that I'm living, like at the current mode of living that I'm doing. Start with that. That's it. That unlocks so much. You see people, they do that and they're like, wait a minute. So that means that if I, it takes me 2000 pounds, you know, of bills every month to live on this planet. That means that if I save up an extra 20,000, I could literally have 10 months off. Like you start thinking that way or you start thinking of, wait a minute, actually, if I make six thousand pounds a month and I pay out two thousand pounds a month, then where's the other four thousand pounds going? Or should I be saving? Or what should I be doing? Like you know, all of a sudden, or it's saying, "Oh, wait a minute, how are my bills four thousand pounds a month and I only make three thousand pounds a month? That's not sustainable." So I just want you to figure out how much do you need to live, bare bones basics for a month. That's it. Start with that. And it starts to just make you think about things differently, um, whether it's how you make your money or whether it's how you spend your money. And this takes me really nicely, actually, which I wasn't sure if you were going to touch upon, but was the mindless spending trap. And I know that you reference this a lot, but I think it's something and I definitely think I am. I put my hand up here. I'm definitely part of that where. Sometimes I just don't think about maybe because it's an Apple Pay or it's because I'm not actually handing over physical money. And this is something for my dad. He always says from his generation, you know how much you're spending because you're getting the money out of your purse and you're giving it away. Whereas yeah. when it's just on my phone or on my on my watch, sometimes you just go, oh yeah, I can just, you know, I'm going to buy that and I'm going to buy this. Yeah. And it's that mindless spending trap that I think so many of us can get into, especially in the new year, where it's like, well, maybe I want to get my body to there and in this amount of time so I'm gonna go into that fad or I'm gonna buy I don't know something to make me feel better about myself which is all really important but sometimes without us noting it down we might not be aware of actually how much we've got going out so I'd love for you just to talk around the power of consumerism and how we can just become more aware of that yeah it's really amazing isn't it when you look back at your accounts I, I there was a point where I was looking back and I thought wait a minute I have like hundreds of pounds going out of my account for services that I don't use. And it's really tough um, to swallow because you realize that if you're working at a job you hate, you're literally working at a job you hate for stuff that you don't use. And it's a really terrible cycle. So for me, um, consumerism, or the power of consuming is something that we don't engage with enough. Um, first of all, number one, just as being an empowered consumer, I want you to feel empowered enough to make choices to consume with people and companies that represent you and reflect your views and your values. So because, for example, it's important for me to see kind of black people on boards. That's why I shop at Sainsbury's, because I know that they had a black woman on their board way before everybody else, way before. Or, you know, if I look at John Lewis Partnership and Waitrose, same thing with Sharon um, being there. Those are because those values are important to me. Your values might be about climate change. They might be about um, gender equality. It might be any sort of thing. But at the end of the day, I want you to shop with companies that, you know, every time you make, you, you're exchanging your money, you're exchanging for and, and empowering a company that reflects your values. But 
in terms of mindless, so that starts you off on a journey of not having kind of mindless spending. But there is a point where you probably want to look back at your account activity and say, hmm, am I using this service? Is this service being used? It's so funny to me. There's so many subscription services out there and people don't seem to, like, they fooled us. And I don't know who these they people are, but they have fooled us to say that we can't cancel it. Like, we can't cancel it and then rejoin. Like, we're like, oh, no, we'll keep it. Even though I didn't use it this month, then I'll just, I'll still keep it because I'm going to use it eventually. Girl, why don't you just cancel it? And then if you need it again, then reschedule yourself. It's all good. It's not It's not a big deal. Right? Like, I don't, the, with the, there was one woman in our group. She had, honestly, 150 pounds of subscription services that she hadn't touched for months. And I was just, well, but she's like, I might use it. I might, I might watch Netflix. I'm like, girl, then cancel it. And then when you want to watch it, just join back in. It's really tough um, because, you know, right, you're right. Our parents, they are from a cash kind of generation. And it is easier to track things when it's in the physical. But what we do have is that we're able to, like, literally at a, two presses of our thumbs, see whole transactions, all of our account activities, and we can have notifications as well. So let's just say you put it in, in some financial institutions, they will give you a notification if you spend at a certain institution. So if I spend at Crosstown Donuts, then I get a little notification coming up. Not hating on you, Crosstown. It's because you know I love you so much. That's why I need a no notification. <laughs> I can literally put, I can categorize things as well. The key difference between kind of spending in cash and spending in, um, you know, electronically is that with cash, you have to make the intention of taking out the money and purposing it to spending it and buying something. With your card, it's a little bit easier to be mindless about it. Like you just kind of carry your card around and you're tracking things after you it's already left your account, which doesn't really help much. <laughs> like it doesn't really, you know, if there's no money in your account, there's no money in your account. But if there's money in your account, then you can go all the way down to zero, just spending mindlessly, where with cash, it's a bit more difficult to do that. So I always say that don't rely heavily on kind of electronic banking and, and electronic tools to track your money. Most of the time, I want you to look forward and plan your money a little bit more because really bank accounts are only going to be able to tell you what's already gone from your account. So you can't really do much about it. But if you're actually planning your money and saying, this is the budget that I have, this is how much I want to spend on this, then it really enables you to take control of your finances in a new and fresh way. So there's a big, big difference between a budget and kind of account activity. Don't use your account activity as a budget, is what I'm saying. I got that. Do you know what? I think with that, you just start becoming a bit more aware of what you're spending. But yes. I think the conversations post that can be quite difficult because I think we've just spoke about the emotions and how we can cope with that ourselves. But I'd also love to talk to you about once we've done that, once we've kind of looked at that we've taken that step we're making actionable steps to making change something that I think is quite interesting here is how do you talk to this about with your partner so say there might be things where you're struggling with or there's things that you might need to change in your lifestyle I think these honest open conversations with your partner whoever that is who you're sharing your life with also can be quite scary to to talk to and, and acknowledge and bring up so what's your advice Bella? what advice would you lend to anyone who is in a partnership but also needs to have these really important conversations as well around money because again we can all bury our head in the sand and, and think we're fine but once we start taking accountability that's probably a big step that many people think about most definitely and you're right most people do not speak to um, their partners or speak to anyone really about money and so I do have some kind of core questions that you may want to start off with again de-angst it don't make it the okay let's both of us be in a dark room with a spreadsheet because that's, that's just <laughs> terrible <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that so why um, go out to get something to eat or go for a walk and don't just talk about kind of the nickels and dimes, as they say, like the, the nitty gritty. I want you to start actually big time and say, OK, well, you know, how do you make money? So what do you do that makes you money? Like, what's your job? Because most most people don't understand each other's jobs, especially if you're working for someone else. Talk about how your parents taught you about money, your general attitudes 
about money as well. If you go for a walk, and I'm making it really, really cheap, and talk about the form of money in your life. Talk about some of the debts, some of the drivers, and some of the, the goals that you have for your money, the kinds of things that are important to you, um, and the, what you spend most of your money on every month, you know, aside from your basic kind of life life expenses. Me, like for example, I spend my money on food. That's it. Like it's definitely food. It's either food eating out or taking out or delivering or but or the groceries. But hey, it's all about food. And I'm, you know, and my partner, he's not like that. <laughs> he's you know, he's more fuel, food is fuel kind of person. So, you know, we've got to kind of talk about that. But start off with those kind of big things first, those big conversations, the big topics first, the general topics that you're getting to know each other. And then you want to start thinking about, okay, well, how are we going to handle our shared finances? Um, is it that our salaries go into separate accounts and then we pool together? Are we going to have any shared goals that we want to pool together for? How are we going to split kind of our life expenses as well? The, that usually takes months, really, to cut, start unpeeling the layers of that onion. Don't try to do it all at once, you know, just maybe schedule some special time where you're going for a walk or it's some key conversations. And I do have some questions in my book to kind of help prompt those conversations. But just know that most people don't talk about your, their finances. Very few cultures kind of encourage kind of familial talking about finances. There's one family I heard um, a woman told me about that they literally sit at the kitchen table on a monthly basis and like the kids just are there when mommy and daddy are doing their their uh, their finances. That's fantastic. Like what are they learning? They're learning so much. And that's where we want to get to. It's part of our home. It's a big thing. Well, it just being British, you know, it's such a stigmatized topic and not that it should be. And, and I referenced that because I was speaking to somebody this week and she was asking me about money. And it was weird, I kept apologising for talking about maybe goals or things that I was like looking on for, for my future. And she said, you have to stop apologising for talking about this. Like, this is really essential to mapping out your life and your goals and where you want to head. And it was really interesting because it made me reflect more on myself and go, why do I feel shameful on talking around money? But there is something there, especially within the British culture, that has this a big shameful topic or umbrella over it that we shouldn't really be talking about this but actually just talking about you know our earlier conversation of how our finances really affect our health and how stress plays a huge part with our financial income how can we actually reduce this shame how can we feel empowered and I think nothing that you bring a lot to this conversation is we need to feel empowered by this and empowered by these conversations but how can we leave this conversation today and go I'm not going to feel shameful around talking about money and my goals and my assets because a conversation shared is, is a problem solved as we've seen in your budgeting meetings but how can we reduce this this shame when you start delving into this you'll see that so many people are suffering again the financial times did a whole feature spread on financial health and wellness because finances are the biggest stressor that it, it, and they're an underlying stressor. It's not like an event stressor where it's, you know, getting divorced or moving home. No, 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 no. It's just a constant weight of stress. And so acknowledge, I want you to know that, that you are not alone. When I do these, um, I do financial wellness sessions for large organizations. And so probably about 150 to 200 people attend. And you think about, it, I've done 50 sessions, 50 to 60 sessions in maybe like the last four months. And so... If you think about 50 to 60 times 200, that's a lot of people and everyone is struggling. If you're looking at the news and the papers, you're seeing that you are not alone. That whole campaigns are being wrought by companies just to help us out with our financial stress, particularly at this time. So I want you to know that you're not alone, that everyone is stressing out and no one knows as much as they want to know about their finances. None of us got taught in school about how we should be managing our finances to be wealthy or to be financially healthy or financially free. So what does that mean? That means, woohoo, yay, you're in good company. And so hopefully that helps, that, that will take away some of the shame. And actually the second part is just gently, gently. So when I say gently, gently, 
gently, gently start to just inquire after your finances and look at, okay, well, how much do I need to spend this month in order for me to live at the level that I'm living at? Um, what are some of my fi goals that I have, my financial goals that I have? Like, what what, what does it mean? What do what, where do I want to be from five years from now or ten years from now? Who in my life do I want to speak to my finances about? When uncomfortable situations come up about finances, how should I deal with them? So, for example, um, there was a time when I was starting my business, I had no loot. And, you know, my friends love to eat. Remember the whole love to eat theme? They love to eat out. And so I had to kind of figure out, okay, well, how is this going to work when, you know, I, I was vegan at the time and, you know, everyone's eating meat and wine and my backside is, you know, drinking my, my little vegan self, you know, and my water and I can't share that bill. I don't have the money to do that. I can't, you know, so therefore I, do I, you know, like how do you deal with those types of situations as well and talk to your friends about them. Say, hey guys, I'm saving for a big goal right now. So I, you know, I can't really spend a lot of money going out. Doesn't necessarily, don't, you know, don't have to say, oh, I'm skinned, I'm skinned, I'm skinned. I don't want you to speak that into your life. It's more so I'm reprioritizing my money in a different way. And so that means I can't eat out or maybe I can't take an Uber or, you know, I'm going to take the, the, the night bus home or something like that. It's small steps, everyday little steps. It's you are not going to be able to read a bunch of books and go to a class and listen to this podcast and feel comfortable. But you can take little steps every day so that eventually you'll be like, oh, I don't know this. Let me go ask somebody. Oh, I don't know this. Let me go talk to this friend. That's what you got to do. That's it. Small steps, my friends. It's a, it's a, it's a journey of a lifetime. It's a journey of a lifetime. It's like motherhood, you know, like it's just a journey that goes through different phases. Absolutely. You mentioned something there and it's definitely one of my questions that I've got. It's related a lot to happiness our financial health but also when we feel like we're maybe going through that change in the mindset and those changes which you went through with maybe I can't eat out with that friend or maybe I need to get the night bus home and that's a change in how I've normally been living or maybe it's something of I've got to be really aware of my heating currently because actually I'm really struggling at the moment like small like big things but lots of different small changes that can really impact our life how can we still keep our happiness levels up when we need to be more restrictive around money? It's that mindset around, okay, I need to make these changes for my longer term goals. How can we still make sure that we're maintaining that happiness there? Well, you know, I read this amazing book, uh, The Happiness Project, and it went through actually what makes people happy. And so you'll find that a lot of the things that actually make us happy in terms of like reflecting physically in our well-being are not necessarily very expensive. So I'd really encourage you, in terms of keeping up your happiness levels, I'd really encourage you to look at what makes you happy and drill down on those a little bit and just kind of plan for them. So for example, I know that being at the beach makes me happy. So I can't afford to necessarily live in Barbados full time with no job. So I planned for trips there i've planned and that means i've planned them for say february i planned them for july and that means that i have a kind of a light to look forward to and then in the meanwhile i can get like a little you know a little band-aid solution by going down to bournemouth or going down to brighton when you figure out what makes you happy then you it's easier for you to figure out the routes for you to get there and it's also easier for you to kind of design lights at the end of the tunnel. I love eating out, but I also know I can't eat out every day. So that means that I have to maybe plan for, instead of having like three meals a week, it's maybe one meal a month. Or maybe it's say, okay, I actually um, having a potluck at my house so that everyone brings new dishes and foods and, cause, and then you really drill down into, well, what makes me happy about eating out? Eating out, by myself is actually not very fun. It's actually eating out with a community of, of people that are getting to know someone. So how can I do that in a way that does, I don't spend as much money? So drill down on what makes you really, really happy. Like I said before, I thought I was happy when I was working at a really big time job with a big time salary. And I realized that starting a business, owning my own business, that's what made me happy and made me free. And that actually took a different type of resource for me rather than it being working for a big company. They're money usually big is things. not the source. Yeah, money's not usually the source of our happiness. 
That's I'm so glad that you said that. <laughs> because only because it relates to him, I can relate to it. And I'm not, I won't go into it because it's not my, you know, I don't want this conversation to be about me. It's, it's about empowering money. But I remember speaking to you this week and saying, isn't it funny how in the Oxford English Dictionary that success is known as three things, the attainment of fame, wealth, and social status. And funny enough, when so many people get to those moments, they're not happy. Yeah. And actually what brings you joy is what brings you happiness and when we uncover it there's so many different things that can bring us joy and they're all individual to us and that's the similar route to what you've been on and and you know listening to this it's about being able to empower yourself around money and not feel depowered by money which I think especially women but many people can feel that especially going into the new year maybe we're daunted by what's ahead of us maybe we're not really clear in our goals but I think something that I'm really getting from this conversation is trying to make a time audit which I think then allows you to put those happiness steps in if I'm correct um you know doing a budget I mean if you don't know what a budget is I'd probably recommend to go and look at your book but trying to assess your budget and your money and start having these conversations with people around you and not to feel shameful but would you say there's anything else around our mindset or things that we can do after this apart from like these three main things that we've kind of put through this conversation that people can do just to make sure that they really are grasping their sense of empowerment around this. I would love for you to have grace with yourself that you're going somewhere that you haven't been before. You're learning new things. It's not going to be easy breezy or perfect the first time you're on a learning journey and think about it in the way that, um, you know, when you first wanted to tie shoelaces, you wanted to wear trainers and you want to tie shoelaces. And I hope you remember that feeling that you had because your fingers were too clumsy and too big when you were trying to put your laces together and make the loop and loop them around. Do you remember that feeling? And now I, if you think about the last time that you wore trainers, you probably don't even remember tying those shoelaces like you were an old pro. And that is a that is just your regular adult or child learning journey. And if you haven't, if you're starting off on your financial wellness and financial health journey, so you're gonna feel so clumsy, you're not gonna know what you're doing. You're gonna be, you're gonna have to ask questions. People are gonna have to wait for you to understand, and it's gonna suck for a bit because you're gonna realize you now you know what you don't know, which is a lot. You're gonna get to a point where it's gonna be an old hat. And you're going to bring other people along. And the same way that I didn't know what I was doing that first time I went to my friend's house and she was budgeting. And then now I have a book on it. And now I run groups, whole budget parties. And I didn't know what I was doing, friends. Don't worry, the learning curve is great. And that's why these conversations are so blooming important because we can always look at who's above us and achieving all these goals, but we forget where people started. And I think that is such a big part of these conversations. That you were there you're in your friend's kitchen with a glass yeah. of wine going what's yeah. the budget exactly and that's when we can all start and i think that's that's really important so honestly thank you so much because i know how important time is and i feel very privileged that you've come on with max today to share an hour of your time with us and our mm-hmm. listeners on this podcast which is going to be so helpful for the starting off the new year in 2023 and so thank you so much for spending that time and sharing that wealth knowledge is wealth in my opinion but before we go I always leave the podcast with the same question which is Melanie what does live well be well mean to you the first thing that comes to mind is extremely personal so it's not everyone but it is live in service and and be of service I I do believe in a, a life for me a life well lived is a life of service so that is it for me but what it is is a personally defined journey it's your own journey and it is a journey i love that i think that's a beautiful a beautiful answer i can heavily relate to some parts of that and i think remembering life as a journey is one we have to always remember because we want to get from a to b quite quickly especially at the beginning of the year um and maybe i speak for myself there but remembering to take that first step and that it's a long staircase maybe many turns in the way is is really important and so people are now listening to this going where can i buy her book where can i speak to melanie more can you please direct people to all of your sites your instagram handles um where you're most active please sure melanie you 
is it's one word and you can i'm on twitter and instagram and facebook and you can find the book at wh smith waterstones all of your your regular bookstores amazon of course online as well via kindle and audiobook which i read myself i was thinking it might be a new job i do love a good audiobook and oh wow it was absolutely brilliant just reading it out loud and um but yeah you can find it anywhere where good books are sold and you can find me at melanieusabi.com as well. Amazing. And just to reiterate the book, it's Financial Wellness and How to Find It. And it's a great read for the beginning of the year. It's a fantastic self-investment, I would say. So thank you so much. And just have the best 